instead of focusing on narratives of despair, we thought that we'd take a glass half full approach. Rather than rehash the conventional doom and gloom admonitions about the future, we're going to explore what a more optimal trajectory for humans and their planet might look like. In this video, we're first going to figure out why the 1970s birthed a frantic wave of planetary pessimism. We'll look and see how fear is an effective motivator, and finally, we'll make a case for how human futures actually look pretty bright. Chapter 1. From Limits to Growth to More from Less Imagine, for a moment, that you're a middle-class American in 1972. Halfway around the world, nearly 4 million people have died in a useless war. JFK is dead. Malcolm X and Martin Luther King are too. So is Fred Hampton, drugged and shot in his own bed by the FBI. Four student protesters were recently shot by the Ohio National Guard at Kent State student protests. Three years ago, the poisoned Cuyahoga River caught fire in America's heartland for the dozenth time. Excruciating news pours in from around the world. Two million starve in Laos, Sudan, and Nigeria. India teeters on the brink of famine, and in China, Mao's cultural revolution slaughters millions. All thoughts of the future are tinged with a red fear. The Soviets have the bomb, and they are not afraid to use it. On the backdrop of all this, a group of MIT scientists publish a massive report, 200 pages, entitled The Limits to Growth, that puts an authoritative scientific stamp on what you've been thinking all along. If humans keep going like this, they're doomed. At the heart of the report was a computer model called World 3 that took historical data from 1900 to 1970 about five variables, the amount of resources, industrial productivity, pollution, food, and population growth, and extrapolated them out to 2100. In most simulations, the results were dire. The human species was headed for a disaster to end all disasters, driven by exhaustion of mineral resources and faltering agricultural production. In the context of the upheaval of the previous decade and the two world wars before that, the report was wildly popular. It struck upon a gut feeling that, no matter how bad it had seemed in the past, it was about to get much, much worse. In 1972, there were only 3.8 billion humans on the planet, and the population was growing exponentially. If everything already felt so close to the brink, what could the future possibly promise? Panic? It promised lots of panic? Chapter 2. Was it worth it? Despite the dire predictions of collapse put forth by the 1970s environmentalist movement, the human population has not collapsed. Growth has slowed, the productivity of arable land has increased, new sources of oil have been found, alternative energies are being developed, but people are still really panicked about the planet. Groups like Extinction Rebellion, a climate change activist coalition that actually has some interesting insights into non-hierarchical organization, writes on their website that humans are, quote, in the midst of a climate and ecological breakdown. We are facing an uncertain future. Our world is in crisis and life itself is under threat. Now is not the time to ignore the issues. Now is the time to act as if the truth is real. The science is clear. We are in the midst of a mass extinction of our own making, and our governments are not doing enough to protect our citizens, our resources, our biodiversity, our planet, and our future. Earth Justice, a group of lawyers dedicated to protecting the planet, actually have set a time limit on the crisis. According to them, there's just one more decade left before climate catastrophe. The United Nations, which you would expect to be the voice of reason in all of this, is also sounding the alarm. They write on their website that, quote, no corner of the globe is immune from the devastating consequences of climate change. Rising temperatures are fueling environmental degradation, natural disasters, weather extremes, food and water insecurity, economic disruption, conflict and terrorism. Sea levels are rising, the Arctic is melting, coral reefs are dying, oceans are acidifying and forests are burning. It is clear that business as usual is not good enough. As the infinite costs of climate change reaches irreversible highs, now is the time for bold collective action. Part of this has to do with what's called hysteresis. Campaigns to improve the world have a really hard time admitting that society has moved in the right direction because that would sort of invalidate the mission of their organizations and would probably contribute to the things getting worse again since the fight to keep the planet healthy is literally never ending. The same way that keeping your own body healthy is never ending. It's not like you just do some exercise and then decide, well, I'm going on exercise from here on out. There's also the fact that fear is an astonishingly effective method for sparking change. 
a multi-institutional study from 2015, which is down in the references below, says that overall, fear appeals are effective at positively influencing attitude, intentions, and behaviors. There are very few circumstances under which they are not effective, and there are no identified circumstances under which they backfire and lead to undesirable outcomes. Fear drove people to organize, and their appeals cleaned up the Cuyahoga... Sorry. Cuyahoga! <laughs> Fear drove people to organize, and their appeals cleaned up the Cuyahoga River, saved the California condor, stopped the use of DDT. The success stories go on and on. Fear passed the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, which made it far too costly for industry to continue their polluting ways. It's clear that fear works when you look at countries that don't have these sorts of protections. Places like India and China routinely have off-the-charts level of air and water pollution, largely due to a lack of effective political organizing campaigns. It was perhaps fear that motivated President Nixon, not known for his warm and fuzzy feelings about nature, to say that the great question of the 70s is, shall we surrender to our surroundings or shall we make peace with our nature and begin to make reparations for the damage we have done to our air, to our land, and to our water? Hmm. The problem with all this fear, though, is that it's impossible to work towards a future when everyone around you is insisting that the future is going to be a complete and horrible disaster. That sort of hopelessness can wear you down after just a few days, but after nearly 50 years? It can destroy your ability to think clearly, it can cause anxiety, depression, and loneliness, just like you're seeing all over the place. Which is why hanging out in space during this next century might be exactly the sort of sandbox you humans need to nail down a new mindset about your primary spaceship, Earth. Chapter 3, The Age of Regeneration. Technology. The answer is technology. What was the question? I think it was, why is going to space exactly what humans need right now? Yes, right, 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 right. Well, the biggest problem with limits to growth was that the entire premise about the dire future of humankind was based on the assumption that business as usual was going to continue. What they didn't account for, what they couldn't account for in a computer model trained on the past, was that uninvented technologies were about to change things for the better. Like, way better. Human population growth, which had hit a peak rate of a 2.2% increase per year in 1962, slowed down from the introduction of birth control, the pill, and the IUD, but also from cultural changes. Three waves of feminism meant that women could own property, work outside the house, and create an independent life for themselves, which led to a further drop in childbirth. Improvements in crops meant that more food was harvested per acre planted, and that doomy predictions about the supply of minerals and oil... That didn't really pan out either. In his recent book, More From Less, Andrew McAfee goes through a lot of the limits to growth claims and shows that countries have continued to get richer while using less mineral resources, and how agricultural productivity has increased even as farmers use less land, less fertilizer, and less water. All of these advances have been due to an increase in technological ability. Like Fraser Kane said during our conversation that follows this episode, technology makes difficult things trivial. And so yes, humans are definitely doing serious damage to their living rooms, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that you creatures don't yet have a solid grasp on how the planet actually works to support you. But space can help. As long as you're earthbound, the incentive to develop earth rejuvenating technologies just isn't there. Like it or not, progress is driven by financial incentives that cover the research and development costs so that those technologies can become trivial and widespread. Cell phone cameras, water filtration systems, laptops, artificial limbs, even cordless tools are all examples of technologies that became widespread only because they were first developed on the government dime in space. Some argue that space industry money should be spent on Earth to deal directly with Earth problems, but perhaps surprisingly, there is some reason to believe that trying to set up a base directly on Mars or the Moon is going to help more people in the long run, specifically because it will spearhead the technological progress necessary to heal the damage humans have so far wrought upon the Earth. And that not-yet-invented invention that might change all of this is going to be a completely self-sustained off-world outpost. Right now, the International Space Station, the only permanent settlement off Earth, can only recycle about 40% of their oxygen and 75% of their water, which means they're completely dependent on Earth for survival. But setting up a permanent colony on the surface of Mars, like what Elon Musk is promising, is going to require far more efficient systems, like 100% totally closed loop level efficient. Those systems will likely be designed with biology in mind, since it's well understood at this point that nature is the best engineer. 
Learning how to make off-world biomes thrive, how to maintain a complex web of microbes, plants, bugs, and animals will be absolutely essential for sustained bases on the moon or Mars. It won't be easy to balance these artificial ecosystems, but the knowledge will be priceless. For each crisis you surmount in these distant sandboxes, you humans will also inch one step farther down the road to rebalancing the world back home. At the end of the day, there is but one certainty. There will be lots of change in the future. Maybe even faster than scientists predict. But heading into a different phase of existence, where the physical limits of the planet aren't the same thing as the physical limits of the humans, will help you build resilience on a changing planet, and will most likely usher in an age of regeneration. Stick around to hear us talk with Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, about all things space, setting up off-world colonies, alien billionaires, and Bitcoin in space. Then in the next few weeks, we have some other adventures planned. A conversation with Mark Nelson, one of the original Biospherians, a discussion with Jerry Pollack about the hidden role of structured water in biology, and a totally new format we're trying out. Mickey and Quinn talk to science skeptics. We seek out people who think that an entire field of science went astray and try to see if we can find some common ground. Still working on how to present those, but we think you're going to love them. So subscribe, sign up for our mailing list. It's in the description and talk to us. Help us steer this ship and stay tuned for the interview that follows with Fraser Kane. See you soon, Keemans. Bye. Bye. In many cases, the flaws in capitalism seem to come mainly from the unaccounted externalities. Can you imagine if the plastic companies had to account for every molecule of plastic that they produce in the end? It would change the nature of, of the amount of plastic that gets produced and, and the costs associated. And we as consumers wouldn't just go and buy a cheap plastic bag because it was going to cost us $5.